and I'm going to uh, turn to the relationship between this and the big context, unless there was something you wanted to say uh, well, about just, this particular. I think the important thing about it is that, it, well, it, that the Obama campaign has prepared people for this view of Trump. So the, there was a narrative out there. Right into right, right. the narrative that they'd already established about him. Okay, so I want to connect that narrative uh, by quoting George Lakoff again. Uh, we cannot understand other people without cultural narratives. We cannot understand ourselves, who we are, who we've been, and where we want to go without recognizing and seeing how we fit into cultural narratives. So Joyce, I'd like to ask you to help us see the American cultural narrative, where we became, where we began. Uh, it's maybe not just one narrative, but many. Uh, but how does our cultural mythology, our sacred stories, how does what's going on now, uh, how does that give us a context to understand it? Do you want to show that clip? Sure. Okay. okay. Uh, we're going to show uh, another clip, uh, and it's the political ad. Of the 1800 campaign. <laughs> Some political watchers are saying this could be the nastiest, most negative election season of all time. This campaign season seems like candidates have taken dirty to a whole new level. When pundits start shouting and politicians start calling each other's names, it can seem like a return to civility is not possible. Like the, the very idea is a relic of some bygone, bygone era. John Adams is a blind, bald, crippled, toothless man who wants to start a war with France. While he's not busy importing mistresses from Europe, he's trying to marry one of his sons to a daughter of King George. Haven't we had enough monarchy in America? I'm Thomas Jefferson. I approve this message because John Adams is a hideous, anapodigital character with neither the force and firmness of a man nor the gentleness and sensibility of a woman. If Thomas Jefferson wins, murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest will be openly taught and practiced. The air will be rent with the cries of the distressed. The soil will be soaked with blood and the nation black with cries. Are you prepared to see your dwellings in flames? Female chastity violated, children writhing in the I'm John Adams, and I move this message. Because Jefferson is the son of a half-breed Indian squaw raised on hoe cakes. And Hamilton is a Creole bastard brat of a Scotch peddler. The nastiest, most negative election. And they have taken dirty to a whole new... It can life. seem like a return to civility that, is that's not it possible. That. Thank you. So... <laughs> This is that he's trying to reassure you to say, don't worry about the nastiness and the mudslinging now. We've always been doing it. And it's wrong. It's a wrong story. And I think what's huh. really important about the election of 1800 is that it, it shows a collective discovery of what democracy is all about. Because 1800, they had such different ideas, they were totally unprepared for a campaign in opposition. Founding fathers did not have any belief or knowledge of parties. They knew about factions over a particular matter, but they had no sense of a group coalescing around principles and then voting consistently on the basis of those principles. So they had clueless about that. They also didn't think there were going to be contested presidential elections. It was going to be a succession. George Washington, followed by John Adams, followed by Thomas Jefferson, all in an orderly way. They didn't think that contested elections were really congruent with the Republican government. Most of their struggles had been with all policies of the crown. So they thought once they got rid of the crown, they weren't going to have this problem. But what's really fascinating is they had no conception of an issue. Now, an issue is something that honorable men and women can differ on. They understand that. But if you don't have a conception of an issue, when someone disagrees with you, they're impugning your honor. One of the fascinating things about the uh, early years of the democracy was how many political duels there were. Why were there political duels? Because people opposed another candidate, but it wasn't around the parlor uh, piano. It was in the newspapers, because you have a democracy that's pushing news. So men were humiliated to have be publicly 
exposed or excoriated for a particular position and often ended up in, in duels. And then the other thing is that they had no idea that there were flaws in the Constitution. The Jeffersonian went into opposition, breaking with his tradition of waiting his turn after eight years at Adams, because he thought the Federalists were just turning America into Great Britain Jr. And it was too important. He couldn't wait. He had to go into opposition. And had such discipline that all of Jeffersonian electors voted the same for the two men who were going to be president and vice president. Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr. The problem is, there wasn't a vice presidential slot. The runner-up got to be vice president, but there wasn't any runner-up. What happened when you have a tie is thrown into Congress. It was even the old Congress that was a Federalist Congress, and they go through 35 ballots before Thomas Jefferson wins. Why? Because the Federalists say, hey, now we can get Aaron Burr, this will be marvelous, we can have a little havoc. And Alexander Hamilton refused to play along because he said he really suspected the integrity of Aaron Burr, where he was only opposed Thomas Jefferson and his womanly attachment to the French Revolution. <laughs> so really in this 1800 election, what you see is a group of gentlemen who fought the revolution, instituted the Constitution, opened it up to a much broader electorate of young men, and, and they're just a 